Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Lynn Mooney, and I am co-owner of Women and Children First Bookstore in Chicago. I'm thrilled to be here today, and I want to welcome all of you for what I'm sure will be a rich and fascinating conversation. But first, we do begin our online events the same way we began our in-store events, and that is with a land acknowledgement. The area we now call Chicago, including the land where Women and Children First is located, is the traditional homeland of the people of the Council of Three Fires, which included the Ojibwe and Potawatomi. This area has long been a vibrant site of trade, life, and community making, and is today home to 65,000 Native people. As the current occupants of this land, many of us are here as part of the legacy of the forced removal of Indigenous people by a settler colonial state. We believe that by taking a moment to make this statement is a step toward honoring that truth and toward healing and rec reconciliation. It can become more meaningful when coupled with authentic relationships and sustained commitment. So I urge anyone interested, whether you are in Chicago or not, to support local organizations such as the American Indian Center and also native art and artists, activists and organizers and others in the community. Now, I have two quick house, housekeeping announcements. First, I wanna to mention to attendees, please type any questions you have today for Nicola or Riva in the ask a question feature at the bottom of your screen. We love chat, but let's save that for all of our unquenchable enthusiasm and focus on putting questions in ask a question so that Riva can more easily find them. Also, I want to mention the um, buy the book box at the bottom of your screen. If you don't already have a copy of Spear or Gollum Girl yet, uh, please use the buy the book box um, and we would be delighted to fulfill your order. So this afternoon, it is my great pleasure to introduce two amazing writers. Nicola Griffith is the author of seven award-winning novels including Hild and Ammonite, and her shorter work has appeared in Nature, New Scientist, The New York Times, and other outlets. She is the founder and co-host of Cryptlit, holds a PhD from Anglia Ruskin University, and enjoys a ferocious bout of wheelchair boxing. She is married to novelist and screenwriter Kelly Eskridge and lives in Seattle. We are here today um, to celebrate the publication of her new book called Spear. Spear is a queer Arthurian masterpiece centered by an unforgettable girl hero. Alex Harrow called the book, quote, humane, intelligent, and deeply beautiful. It's a new story with very old bones, a strange place that feels like home. And I thought that was a great description. Um, today, Nicola will be in conversation with Riva Lehrer. Riva is an artist, writer, and curator whose work focuses on issues of physical identity and the physically challenged body. She is the author of Gollum Girl, now available in paperback. She is best known for representations of people with impairments and those whose sexuality or gender identity have long been stigmatized. A longtime faculty member of the School of the Art Institute of Chicago, she is currently an instructor in medical humanities at Northwestern University. So thank you, Nicola and Riva, and I'm going to turn this over to you. Thank you. Well, I guess I'll start. Um, oh, there, I, there we go. Uh, I am incredibly honored uh, to be in conversation with Nicola. Um, we know each other uh, because of sort of an odd story. Um, 15 years or so ago, at least, I started reading her work and thought it was absolutely revolutionary and gorgeous and fascinating and not like anything else I'd ever read. So I got a little obsessed and uh, I decided out of the blue that I was going to contact her um, in Seattle and ask if she would sit for a portrait and she was, shall we say skeptical in the beginning, but it happened. I went to Seattle and we have been friends ever since. 
And one of the thrills has been to be a little bit on the inside of Nicola's writing process. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Nicola, who is going to tell us about Spear and do a reading. Thanks, Riva. Um, yes, I'm going to start with a reading um, from Spear, which is, it's a, a short novel set in the early 6th century in Wales, and it blends Welsh history, Arthurian legend, and Irish myth. It's essentially the story of a young hero raised by her traumatized mother in a cave in a, a mountain valley called Ustrad Tui. It's the whole thing's very Welsh, so there's not much Welsh pronunciation in the part I'm going to read. You need, do need to understand a couple of things before I begin that reading. Um, one of the important things is that Peritia, which is the name of the hero, she gets her name eventually. She learns to understand what's hidden to most people. She tastes things in the rain and hears things in the breeze. And through that, she becomes aware of this hidden lake, a cool, clear lake that she knows one day she'll find. And eventually she, she needs to leave the valley to go find that lake and to find out who she is and what she can do. So she leaves and on her travels, she acquires um, basically a, a broken down bony old gelding and uh, also a broken sword. The tip, about the last three inches of the tip is missing and tatty, much mended armor. She also encounters the companions of Arturus, um, the knights formerly known as of the Round Table, and um, their companions of the king. And she senses that these companions are connected somehow to the lake. So she wants to join them. Um, but they tell her, nope, come back when she's made a name for herself. So she sets out to do just that helping farmers get rid of the bandits beginning to plague the countryside all around. And one day she hears about the worst bandit of all, a blight on the land, the Red Knight. Peritia rode now through lands abandoned by people and sharp with the scent of vinegar, where apples untended had fallen and rotted in the grass. A good land, and rich, but poisoned by fear. Midway across a cold, clear stream, she caught the thick scent of corruption and stopped. She loosened the rain. Drink deep, bony, drink your fill, for there might not be much ahead that was good and clean. On the far bank, she gave Boney the last beans mixed with oats, then turned him loose to graze while she saw to her gear. The blades were sharp, sharper than sharp, and well oiled, but she oiled them again, even the pointless sword. She checked her mail coat, scale by scale, and put it back on. The cap she turned over in her hands. It was a little tight now. She might wish Boney were bigger, and she might wish for a shield, but this is what she had. In Ustrad Toi, close to the bounds of Duvath, there was a blackthorn where shrikes spiked their prey, mouse pups and caterpillars, smaller birds and bees, a score of dead things drying to husks, hanging as a larder and a warning. The red night had hung more. Bare alders and willows still clinging to their leaves grew on both sides of the ford, and the crook of every bough held remains. Men, women, even children, two dogs, a goat, half an ass. And that was just the carcasses fresh enough to recognize. There were more, many more, that had rotted into strips of leather and old bone held together by a piece of armor, a boot or a sleeve. In the dappled light on the far bank, Mounted on a giant roan, waited a man cased in red leather, sewn with red enameled iron scales. Not just a sleeve jacket like the old thing Peritier wore, but also plate strips on his breeches, a high collar and gauntlets sewn with small plates on each finger. 
Even his boots were plated. The shield on his left arm matched. Red leather stretched over wood and painted with a black snake with golden eyes and tongue. Around its edge, another snake, this time of armoured scales, glinted in the shimmering tree light. Boiled leather covered the horse's chest, face and neck. The man wore a massive war helm of red enameled iron, a big two-handed sword sheathed on the left of his saddle, and a great lance tucked under his right arm. Peritier patted Boney's shoulder and could not tell if her horse trembled or she did. Was this fear? She felt once again that first cool kiss of the dream lake. The lake was her destiny and her path to it lay through this night. She forced her war hat more firmly on her head and wished suddenly to see her valley again, see it in one of those precious sunlit days when forget-me-nots lay scattered blue in the grass and the light on the trees glowed like polished bronze. But then a fly lifted from the giant red lance and hummed over the water, and in the air stirred by its wing, she felt the strength of the arm that held that lance and the speed with which it could change the direction of the brutal tip, an edged blade as much as a point. With nothing in her hands but Boney's reins, she kneed him forward. The red knight's horse overtopped her own by two hands. Boney would not survive a blow to his head or neck from those plate-sized hooves and that shield. She took a deep breath. I am Peritier, Paladier here. She used her lungs, large from years of running the valley, and her gut muscles, and her voice belled and boomed like a huge hound. In the name of Arturus King, your life is forfeit. With Boney's first step into the river, the knight's memory of sharpening the scales around the rim unfurled in her mind like a scroll. When the knight kicked his own giant mount forward, its tail flicked an alder at the water's edge, and she knew from the scent of its bark that, hidden from sight, another two spears were propped against its trunk, waiting. She kicked Boney into a trot, and he splashed water high around him in a brave show, and with her knees holding him steady, she pulled out her boar spear, which she tucked under her left arm, then her javelin, which she held easy in her right. She swayed with Boney, loose and lithe as the river, while the bandit knight bore down on her like a red tide. He was ferment and rot, wearing the gear of a prince, a wave of blood and rage. Send me strength, she called in her heart, kicked Boney to a gallop and hurled her javelin hard and true. It took the shield near its edge and swung it swung it into his lance, nudging, nudging it off its line, just as she and Boney swept past inside the reach of the Red Knight's blade, close enough to feel the wind of the shield as it missed, then swerved and thrust her boar spear at his thigh, and they were past. Both horses turned. Peritier wiped at her jaw, blood dripping down her cheek. The red shield had not missed. She put it from her mind. The knight shook his shield, but the javelin had burst through leather and wood and was unmovable. He threw down the shield and kneed his mount into a tight turn. He was bigger. His mount was bigger. His lance was bigger, and he knew this river. She could not win. But as he came, Peritia felt through her palm the wood of her spear, from the wood the blade, and at the tip of the blade a taste of blood. Not much blood, for she had barely pricked him, 
But now she could feel his life, feel the red night as she felt herself. Now his knowledge was her knowledge. She felt his belly tighten as he lifted his lance a fraction and knew he planned to lower the point and take Boney in the lung. She felt the movement of his eyes as he searched for and found the telltale runnel of water where a hidden tree root might trip the unwary. Even as she felt it, she lifted Boney to a jump up over the root and pulled her tipless sword free. As his lance point dropped, she slashed down, taking off both blade and a handspan of shaft just before it slammed into Boney and sent him crashing down in the water. She leapt free, waist deep, boar spear in one hand and pointless sword in the other. And as the night thundered past, she swang again hard, high up along the shaft of his lance, leaving him holding a stub. He tossed the stub aside and spurred his horse for the bank, for the tree and the hidden spears. She could not move fast against the weight of water, not as fast as a mounted man. So she did the only thing she could and hurled the boar spear across the horse's path straight into the bank. The roan caught its leg and went down. The red night rose. A red, raw mountain rose and pulled his sword free from the thrashing horse. They stood opposite one another, she to her waist in the water, he with his back to the bank and only to his knees. She moved on a slant closer to the bank to where he knew, as now did she, that the riverbed sloped up towards the grass. Now she was only thigh deep. They faced each other, and the sun shone full on the bandit knight's face. His eyes were glass green, almost wholly green, with centres tight as pinpricks. I'll hang you, he said, in a voice harsh as gravel. I'll hang you alive, pinned by your own spear, but not through anything vital. I'll eat your horse while you watch. And every day I'll cut a piece from you and laugh as you rot and beg to die. And he waded towards her. She could do nothing but watch him come. She felt the power of his muscle against the weight of water, saw the length and weight of his sword, knew the strength of his armour, armour on his throat and chest and arms and belly and thighs. Her sword could not stab through that armour. It had no point. She would die hanging on his tree. Her legs trembled. She could not stand against him. So she did not. As the wake of his travel washed against her and that great sword drew back for a scything cut that would take an arm or her head, she breathed deep and dived flat under the water, under his blow, and slid the edge of her blade across the inside of his knee where a riding man never wore armour, could not wear armour. He stumbled to one knee and she pulled her pointless but razor sharp hoe oh, sharper than sharp sword back along the inside of his other knee, slicing it open deep to the bone. He fell sideways and she pushed herself up, breathing hard to one knee and one foot, the foot on his sword trapping his blade and thrust her own pointless sword down against his chest, pushing him under. As she got her feet under her, she shifted and lifted her sword and thrust down again, this time on the plate across his throat. She leaned her whole weight on the flat tip of the blade, leaned and leaned, gasping, holding on while he thrashed, holding on even as the water turned red around him and he went still. On even as she sank, exhausted, to her knees, still holding, still leaning. Until Boney, limping, nosed the back of her neck 
and she fell against him, weeping, the blood running down her face, mingling with blood from the ragged tear on Boney's chest, and running with the river away. I'm speechless. You know, even having read that, Nicola, and I read it twice um, when I was going through the book, um, I'm reminded so powerfully of why I was enthralled from the beginning. The physicality of your writing comes from obvious knowledge. Um, for people who don't know, you have a background as a martial artist. And so you're not only your uh, fight scenes, but your understanding of how people carry themselves in the world who need to be warriors of any kind um, just permeates the book. And it's, can you comment on that a little bit about um, how you think about your, your past as a martial artist and instructor and how it informs um, the narrative? <laughs> Um, you know, I've never really thought that much about it. It's just, I'm just, I've always been a very physical person. I mean, I, I grew up, I was one of those kids that climbed every tree she ever saw or, or, or slid down the banisters instead of walking down the steps. Um, I loved the jungle gym at school, that kind of thing. I love to throw myself about and, and I like the rough and tumble um, I love any kind of game where you chase the ball or hit a ball. I, as soon as I discovered that you were allowed to hit people as part yeah. of sport, I'm like, oh, this is awesome. So, yeah, hitting things, whether it's a tennis ball, a badminton, um, shuttlecock, uh, cricket ball, a person, a heavy bag. Wow, hitting a heavy bag is it feels so good. It is cathartic. I can recommend it to anybody. But in terms of how it works with my writing, um it basically all my main characters, all my protagonists are also really physical people. They love to be outdoors, they love wide open spaces. They they learn from observation of, of nature and people and the way people move. And they use their senses uh, all the time. One of the things I do with my work or like to think that I do is to create this kind of narrative empathy. And the way I do that is by linking the reader's senses to the protagonist's senses, because we all know, we all have the same kind of sense of smell. We all see roughly the same things, although there are many arguments to be made about cultural perceptions of color, but we don't need to go there. Um, we all understand feelings like lust and terror and joy and disgust. There, there are some very specific things that are cross-cultural. And so I try to evoke those things because then no matter how different the reader and the character are, they know they have this really basic human stuff in common. Um, and I know I'm losing track of your question, which is no, yeah. martial arts and yeah. the body, but this is yeah, just yeah. kind of where I go to. Well, I, what I experience in the physicality of your characters is that not only are they very aware of, you know, as you said, how they're moving, how other people move, what their aims are entangled with their physicality, they are completely embedded in the sensory world. And when you have been writing uh, in this, in Spear, in Hild, and in the upcoming, is it Meanwood? How? Yes, Meanwood, the sequel yes, to Hild. Which, yeah. um, you have a wonderful way of looking at historical research, not just as how would one cook dinner, what would one be eating, how do you keep clean, what's it like to 
husband animals, the there's no separation. You're you have this continuity of the protagonist and the world. And so when you, you yourself are, I mean, you're, what you're doing is feels like you're reminding the reader, yes, they have these senses, but we forget them. And you pull us back to that place. When you're writing, um, when you're doing research, and I know that you do immense research for your books. Are you thinking about, oh, well, here's this tool, they use it for this. Tell me a little bit about how you put yourself in the place of the person using that tool and building a world that's not just that tool, but a whole environment. I can give you an, an example from Hild. Please. So when I was um, researching Hild, I, I researched everything. I, I researched meteorology. I researched the change in the climate. I researched flora and fauna and jewelry and textile production. And it was actually textile production that really broke that book open for me. Because I read just this little factoid just in the middle of all my research that women in the early 7th century spent 65% of their time on textiles. Now, 65% is more time than childcare, sleep, and food preparation put together. So what that meant was that they were doing it all the time while they were doing other things. And so I thought, oh, wow so cloth is going to be really important and so i thought okay what did they make their clothes from what did that look like and and i would just go from one object to another in my head i would have to think okay so they made these kind of strange looking coarse combs from iron to scutch flax so but then, you know, how do you make the iron? You have to dig the ore and you have to smelt. So there have to be people who are smelters and they're going to be kind of weird, those people over there, quite secretive. And they're going to have to work with the charcoal makers. And, and so gradually this whole ecosystem just grows out of the fact that 65% of women's time is textile production. So it's, it's a very subconscious, it's a very unconscious uh, natural process for me. Things just unfurl from little tiny snippets. It's enormous oh. fun, actually. And and Peritia herself, the whole of Spear comes from some incidental research I was doing for Meanwood. One of my part of my process um, when I'm writing a big historical novel like Hild or Meanwood is to draw maps to really n understand distances. Uh, because you really need to know that in these times. And for that, I needed to know what places were called because, I mean, you can call them anything you like, but it would be nice to have it be roughly what it might have been called back then. So for that, I had to research how words change and how, where place names come from. So for then, so I was doing all this etymological research and it was taking me back to the sixth century, so a century before Hild, just to try to get at the root of things. And it was while I was doing that, that I discovered this philologist called Andrew Breeze, who, who's done work in all, all different areas. Um, but he had also written this little article from his philological research about how he declared who Arthur was, that he was basically a minor chieftain north of Hadrian's Wall in 537. I can talk more about that later, but the point of this conversation is that in my research, I came across all sorts of Welsh words. And it was those Welsh words that made it possible for me to bring in the Irish mythology 
to the Arthurian legend. And I did that because, okay, so the two hard day, the, the gods, the she, basically, have four treasures, the cauldron, the spear, the shield, and the stone. And three of those, obviously, are really easy to map onto Arthurian legends. You've got Excalibur, you've got the sword, the, the stone Excalibur's pulled from, and you've got the grail. Those are, it's really easy. But the spear, it's like, where does the spear fit? It doesn't fit. But then this philological research, I figured out that the name for spear is Hudir, and um, the name for hard is Ber. And in fact, Peretir comes from Ber Hudir, so spear enduring, so a uh, hard spear. So Peretir could be the spear. So then I was happy, and then I was off to the races. Well, going back to spear, um, one thing that I wanted to remind people of, if they've read the book or not, is that in that entire fight scene, um, and for a huge proportion of the book, people don't know that Peretia is female. They think that she's a stripling. So when they're looking at her uh, and sizing her up as uh, an opponent, they're seeing basically a teenage boy mm -hmm. and you know, talking about cultural um, inability to see, it doesn't even occur to them that she might be female. Well, um, at least for the boys. I mean, like a lot of the women have a clue. A lot of the women have a clue. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, honey, <laughs> which I love. But um, I know that, uh, you sent me um, a commentary on doing the book and that you had been approached some time ago to do a version of the Arthurian legend and that you were very reluctant. Um, I mean, certainly it's been approached from so many standpoints. Mm -hmm. And tell us about what, um, what finally drew you in and what you saw as, see, as your... Um, opening up and reinterpreting um, of the legend, which you do so incredibly well. I have always loved the matter of Britain, Arthurian legend. I've always loved this sense of the landscape of long ago, the mist on the moors and the many years looming from the mist and the, the sense of the, the dark tangled forest by the side of the road. I've just loved it. And I have always loved the notion of Camelot too, where people fight for justice and truth and all that stuff. What I really hated about the matter of Britain was never seeing people like me moving through that landscape. So, you know, there were never any Crips or queers or people of color or people who weren't noble in some way. Uh, very few women, and the women there there were were really uh, they were cliches, they were tropes, and there's a really good reason for that because the matter of Britain is a national origin story, and so this this sort of sense of manifest destiny is it's really baked in. You just have to look at, at the present day um, UK royal family. There are Charles, his son William, and his son Lewis all have the name Arthur in as part of their name. Every single one. Um, and, and for hundreds of years, British royals have taken the name Arthur to bolster this nationalism. And in fact, if if you I'm getting off the subject a bit, but not much. If you look at, at things like Tennyson his um, idyls of the king. It, it's really a song of empire. It's all about how your noble, straight, white, manly men are, are born to lead. They're born to rule other people. It is, it was really, I couldn't see how to break that open. And so when I was asked to contribute a short story 
to um, the anthology Sword Stone Table, which is a great anthology, by the way. Everyone should go buy it right now because lots of people could write the short story. And I, I said, no, I can't do it. Um, but then I had this idea. I had this vision of this really just young person on this poor old bony horse in the wood in really tatty armor. And I, all of a sudden, all that etymological research I was telling you about fell into my head. And I thought, holy shit, I know how to break this open because this is Peritia. And in the Arthurian legend, Peritia is basically Percival. And even Percival was, was raised away from society. And I saw this way to make this person grow up as um, naive. And by naive, I mean untrammeled by the prejudices of society. I mean, she doesn't know that it's not cool to be a girl and have a sword. She doesn't know it's not cool to be a girl and like other girls. She has no idea. She, to her, it's all wonderful and normal and natural. And so she's she hasn't internalized any prejudice or bias at all. And so it was a really cool way to sort of Break, an, break open this fossilized legend and scoop out all, all the non-disabled white noble people and just pour it, just pour it full of people, ordinary people that have always been there and that we've never allowed to be in these legends. So yeah, to me, that's one of the things that I did with this story and I had the best time doing it as well. Well, Peritia, um, part of the arc that was really important to me is that I don't want to spoil anything whatsoever, so I'm not going to talk about any plot points at all. But her, her own quest leads her to a place in which she can be seen. And it's not just that she has this kind of untrammeled purity or or innocence of a particular kind not a um st stupid innocence or you know she's not candide um but a, a wide openness and that's you know one of the her relationship to the natural world and her ability to read the wind to the insects the bend of a grass it's part of that enormous wide openness mm -hmm. and which uh, there's a moment in the book in which that becomes dangerous, which I also really loved. Um, but one of the things that ties that to all your writing for me, when I first started reading your writing, it was your um, mystery series, um, the, the odd books. Is the odd owd? I pronounce it owd. Um, I uh, and most people pronounce it odd, and and I suspect Norwegians pronounce it somewhere in between. <laughs> so use whatever pronunciation you like. It, it it doesn't matter. There's a way when you've written about queerness, um, that you've really striven to put it in the world in a way that it is not. Uh, a factor of um, abuse the, mm. the, that's, you know, I mean, the, the reasons that I fell in love with your books is that all of the other lesbian literature, such as it was that I was reading at the time, everyone was suffering terribly. For oh, I get so tired of and, that. I, I wanted the queer body to be a site of delight. Yes. yes. Not, not misery or upset or, harm oh and speaking of harm i want to reassure people that uh no horses were harmed in that scene both horses are just fine so i just wanted to let you know but yes no no in my books i just i cannot be doing with any kind of women no don't suffer for being women people of color do not suffer for being people of color disabled people don't suffer for being disabled 
Queer people don't suffer for being queer. They may suffer for other reasons. They may do stupid things and, and suffer the consequences, but it's because of what they do, not because of who they are. So I'm really, that's a big, that's kind of a hard line in my work. It's for me, it's the, <clears throat> oh, that is, that was our 40 minutes. Um, I'm in a moment, I'm going to check and see if there are questions, but I do want to say that, um, for me, all of that provides such a space of being a breath that everyone out there, um, all of our, our viewers, if you're not familiar with Nicola's work, um, know that once you enter her world, you're going to feel a sense of expansiveness in who you are that I don't find almost anywhere else. And I just want to really thank you for giving us that. So I'm going to put on my reading glasses and see if we have questions. And you and I have endless things to talk about if there aren't. But please, people, please put some questions in the uh, ask a question um, thing because she writes com complicated worlds. So let's see what we got. Okay. Uh, many people saying, oh, my God, are you wonderful, which you are. Um, this is my first time trying to do this on Crowdcast. So uh, if someone would be very nice and ask a question so that I can see where it shows up so that I can um, pass it on to uh, Nicola. Any old question. If you follow her blog, her cats alone are worth about <laughs> four hours. I'm yes, it's their, it's their birthday next month. I shall do a special blog post about their third birthday. Mine is on Monday. My, my birthday is, ah, question. What was your experience narrating the book for the audio version? Oh, thank you, because I wanted to ask you if there was an audio book, because my God, are you a wonderful reader? Yes, I, I, I narrated the audio book. And my experience was... It was really interesting. It was really good and it was interesting. And for those who who um, want to read the really fine, it's basically audiobook process porn. I've written this this two part blog post on my on my website called um, Speaking Spear, so you can go find that. But um, what I loved about doing this book in particular, I've, I've done one audio book before this, was uh, I had this great director. I've never been directed before. I've never really been in plays or I've never, never had direction. So I didn't really know what that would be like. I thought I might get a bit tense about it. In fact, I loved it. I was like, so we began, you know, I, I know how to read my own work. And so I read the first page. And I thought, oh, this is going well. She's, That's great. Now we're really in it. So why don't we go back to the beginning and do it again? And I'm like, uh, okay. And she's now, and this time, and she directed me, she said, you need more. This, you've got a really storyteller's voice here. So let's, let's hear that. Let's hear you really lean in. And I, I if, if you want, I can find the beginning and, and do please, what she told me to. Please, because I'll, I'll just read I'll read the sentence. I wonder if they had the same director. Um in the wild waste, a girl growing. A girl at home in the wild, in the leafless thicket of thin grey saplings with moss growing green on one side. In this thicket, the moss side does not face north, etc., etc. But she made me read it. She should I say she suggested forcefully that I read it in a in a very much a come closer, boys and girls. Mm. Mm. Lay your put your head on, on your arms and listen to this story. You know, it just it was like. She made me imagine what it would be like to to basically to be a kid back in grade school and you know you have story time and you just ah so so that's what I did and and it's a much better book for it honestly having that direction so yeah it was a great experience for me 
It's um, fascinating because I also did my own audiobook, which I had not been expecting to do at all. So and how was it for you? Well, it was right at the beginning, the height of COVID. Mm. And so it was fairly hilarious in a grim sort of way because I was in the recording booth and my produ producers on the other side and my director is in my headphones and she was in New York. And <clears throat> I started out and she made me go back and she wanted to hear my consonants more. I, you know, first it was sort of technical hitting the words so that they were clear. And then it was going back and what is your emotion? What are you feeling? And then it was going back again to be intimate and put all that together. But each time we had to um, adjust the pop screen or change the angle of the mic or change the settings, I would have to back all the way up in the corner of the studio, which was fairly large because they, they record a lot of like rock stars and stuff. I guess in this place. So I'd go all the way in the back corner, turn into the corner so I'm not breathing on the, because nobody knew anything at the in the beginning with COVID. The producer engineer would come in and fiddle with the equipment, go back around. I'd come up and do a demo. They'd come back. It was like one of those um, Swiss cuckoo clocks where both things <laughs> were happy and one of his families when I needed water the door to the studio would open and this arm would come in with the bottle and just hand me the water. And I'd like run up and snatch the bottle and go back in the corner. But I agree being directed was its own wonderful joy. I learned so much about reading and listening from doing that. So we have a follow-up question. One of the challenges of reading an audiobook comes with not being certain of the spelling of technical, multilingual, and other words outside one's vocabulary. Did you find any way to meet this particular challenge? Um, yes. Yeah, please. <laughs> yes, it was, this was a big challenge for me because this book is filled not only with, um, if, if you include the, the author's note at the end, which I thought I would be reading, but it turns out I, I didn't have to, but it, it has lots of Welsh words and it has um, an Asturian and it has um, French and Middle German and a whole bunch of different things that I had to learn how to pronounce and Irish too. I mean, Irish is just wicked hard. I have never understood Irish pronunciation. I've got a rough idea of Welsh, but I wanted to get it really perfectly right. So, um, my producer, audio producer, actually talked to people in Wales. They have, because they have offices all over the world. And they got people to just read out. I made a list of words and they read them out into a sound file. And so I, I listened and I internalized how they were supposed to sound. Um, and then, of course, kind of threw it away because you can't do in everyday conversation, the full bore pronunciation. It would be like being in the pub and, and hearing two Americans talk about Paris. You know, they wouldn't, they would say Paris. Mm -hmm. So you have to adjust. So I have um, a Northern person using Welsh names and I have a guy from Greece using Welsh names, and they would pronounce these things differently. So it was this constant, it was really good knowing what the baseline pronunciation was, but then this constant adjustment of that. So it was it was a challenge. It was like this moving jigsaw all the time. It was fun, actually. It does sound like fun. Um, we're getting lots of questions now. Um, do you ever find that your characters answer questions that you had about identity or the worlds they live in that you didn't know the answers to when you started writing? Does that make sense? Did I? It makes sense, but the answer is no. Um, okay. I, my characters never have questions about their identity. That's not true. My, my last book, So Lucky, was all, uh, it was the only book I've ever read where the identity issue was the problem. 
if you like, in the book. That that was the point of the book. Um, that's the only time I've ever done that. I think it's the only time I ever will. So that character was actually exploring these issues. And having said that, I had already explored them. I, I knew the answers. It's not like she was asking questions that I didn't know to ask. But um, having said that, my second novel, Slow River, I wrote that to find the answer to a question. It wasn't about identity per se. It was about the fact that um, I spent about 10 years in, in this city in the north of England. It was a very depressed and depressing city. And I lived in um, what you might politely call the underbelly of society. I knew murderers and drug dealers and prostitutes. Um, and I didn't know a single person with paid employment. We, that's not how we earned our money. Um, and after a while, I didn't like that world. I wanted to get out of it. And I managed to escape it. And then there were all these people who never managed to escape it. And so looking back, I looked at that and I thought, how come I could get out and they couldn't. Mm. And I wrote a book to try to figure that out. And it turns out that the answer is really simple, is that we were never in the same place to start with. We just looked as though we were. Those people who couldn't escape, they hadn't been born with the advantages I had. You know, I, 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 I was born into a lower middle class family. I expected my life to be okay even though for years I lived in this bad situation still some part of me had been raised differently and I was lucky I was smart I was well educated um and these people weren't uh and so although it looked as though we were in the same place we were actually crossing rather mm -hmm. than coming from the same place so yeah that actually taught me a fair amount just writing that book taught me a fair amount about class it made me really internalize lots of notions of class memoir? yeah no that's slow river oh that's slow river yeah um, i uh, for people out there um there is a remarkable totally creative and unusual memoir um, I don't know if it's available at all, but your memoir. Um, there were only ever 450 copies and they're all gone. So, unless you can find someone willing to sell you one, well, then okay. the last one I know of sold for about $100. I'm hoping someday it gets reprinted. It is quite wonderful. Mm -hmm. um, here's another question uh, It's clear reading Hild. I'm sorry, um, people, the sound is doing something odd. It's clear reading Hild or Spear how incredibly in-depth the research you do is. Do you read a lot of social history and nonfiction that sparks these worlds, or does the idea always come first and then you set out to research? Interesting question. It's hard to say. Um, it's not that I have an idea, it's that I have a question. It's almost always... Books almost, for me, almost always come from a question. So the question for Hild was, I had gone to Whitby and had been amazed by the place. And then I found out it was founded by a woman 1400 years ago. 1400 years ago in a time that used to be called the Dark Ages, um, where might was right and it was full of petty warlords and petty kingdoms. And women were supposedly chattel and had no autonomy whatsoever. And um, and I thought, well, how come a, a woman 1,400 years ago could found this place? And we still know who she is. And, and it became a very famous place of learning and meetings that happened there changed the world. And so I thought, well, what kind of woman could do that? And what was the world really like? And so I wrote Hill to answer that question. So I had to do a lot of research to figure out what the world was like. 
so I could put Hilda inside it and grow her inside that world to see what kind of person she would have to be to deal with that world to the extent that she did. I hope I'm answering your question. I, th I think so, um, which brings us to Meanwood. And so you've done this immense amount of research for Hild, and now you're moving into what, where her life goes. Um, was there a, a completely new direction of research you had to do in order to move her forward? Or once you've sort of established that world, can she then sort of move around inside it autonomously? Uh, yes and no. I mean, I had to, ex she, because Hild was about her aged three to aged 18. Mm -hmm. So she was growing up. And then Meanwood, I thought Meanwood was going to be about her from age 18 to 33. But it turned out there was so much interesting stuff. It's only from her from 18 to 22. Oh, wow. Yeah, and it's 30% bigger than Hilt. So it's enormous. But what I had to learn for this book is basically travel and logistics and war tactics. So I've become a kind of military historian and logician <laughs> now. Yeah. But I've had the best time. So yeah, Hills has to take a really quite different role in Meanwood. When, when will we have the opportunity to read it? This time next year is when it will be out. It's all done. So what is on your mind these days? Not much. I'm really, I'm quite looking forward to some kind of holiday actually first i think that's top of my list i mean i i've written a lot in a very short time pretty yeah. recently and i need to just you know ease down a bit and having said that for those who may already have read spear you may have a a hint of possible things to come so i'm thinking about that i have to i've been contracted to write three new out short stories because the books are going to be reissued by FSG, my current publisher. Um, so I, I'm going to write original, uh, an original story to go with each book. Um, always more Hilt. There's, there's so much more Hilt to go. I mean, I will be writing and researching Hilt for decades I think but so I'll write a hill book and then I'll do some other things and I'll write another hill book and I'll do some other etc 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 always more hilt um and there's a big huge fantasy novel I've been thinking about for mm. years except yeah. it may not be a fantasy novel you could maybe even think of it as a kind of alternate history involving alien science if you like but the tagline is Imagine the fall of Rome happening at the same time as the fall of something nasty from the sky. Oh, and, uh, and, and then it moves on a few hundred years. So I would be telling a story set in about the equivalent of about the ninth century, but a slightly different ninth century. So there's that. Um, Oh, and so many other things. I mean, I, you know. And the thing about ideas is that they multiply. There's always far too many things to write about. There's always more ideas than there is time to deal with them. You know, um, last, a uh, little over a week ago, I was in Atlanta and I happened to visit the Carlos Museum, which is full of uh, artifacts starting I, I at least 1500 be, before common era and they had descriptions of how the artifacts were used they did a really nice job of giving you more than just you know here's a stone knife or here's a bowl I mean they and I kept thinking about you because I could take that little bit and start imagining you you had sort of helped train my imagination in terms of how to take 
uh, a sensory experience and let it take you to unexpected places. So mm -hmm. let's hear it for wonderful literature. Um, I think we're probably at our, uh, Lynn, are we at our time now? Oh, Lynn. Sorry, my toggle finger was weak. Um, yeah, I thought that was a wonderful moment too. Um, so thank you, uh, Nicola and Reva. Thank you everyone who's here with us today. What a wonderful conversation. Um, and I'm so delighted both of you have read your audiobooks yourself. Yeah. Um, as an audiobook listener, I always feel like it's this performance just for me. Mm -hmm. I just love the intimacy of that. And now I'm going to seek out the audio of both your books. Well, thank so you. thank you again, everyone. Um, we here at Women and Children First are just delighted to have hosted this event. So thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Look up uh, Nicola's list. There's quite a variety of things that she has addressed over time. And I can't recommend her work more highly. So thank you, everyone. Thank, thank you. you.